So these include um, very thorough, very comprehensive traces of material existence, ranging from the details of costume, like brooches or hairstyles, to the details of the technology of writing, the type of paper or tools used, or the technology of warfare for that matter. So this is a, a material aspect of the archive, Orlando's archive. Orlando, of course, is an archive of mores, rituals and social contracts, written and unwritten. And of course, an archive of literary styles and techniques and artistic habits. Finally, it is an archive of desires, of yearnings, of affective conundrums, of bodily responses. But most importantly, Orlando is an archive that simultaneously, that is, as it develops, questions the aspiration of literary texts to be an exhaustive or even comprehensible archive. So it is an archive that questions its own existence as an archive or its own usability as, a, as an archive that can, we can fully trust. Um, I wouldn't like this to become an exercise in abstraction, so this is why I gave you the uh, bit of text um, to exemplify how um, Orlando might work as an archive and um, how Wolf's initial impetus to artistically archived, transforms the pages themselves and implicate the novel in a circle of archiving exchanges. Um, I shall read out two paragraphs towards the end of the novel. It's, it's Wolf's present day um, and offer some observations on them. Of course, Wolf starts with her exemplary archiving move that is well familiar for those who, who know her fiction. Um, that is the activity of looking out of the window of starting her archiving process by this glance out of the window, opening of the window, anything to do with, with breaking of the interior into material, into the exteriority. The only resource now left us, she says, is to look out of the window. There were sparrows, there were starlings, there were a number of doves and one or two rooks, all occupied after their fashion. One finds a worm, another snail. One flutters to a branch, another takes a little run on the turf. Then a servant crosses the courtyard wearing a green base apron. Presumably he's engaged on some intrigue with one of the maids in the pantry, but as no visible proof is offered us in the courtyard, we can but hope for the best and leave it. Clouds pass, thick or, th uh, thin or thick, with some disturbance of the color of the grass beneath. The sundial registers the hour in its usual cryptic way. One's mind begins tossing up a question or two, idly, wanely, about this same life. Life it sings, or croons rather. It's like, well, life it sings, or croons rather, like a kettle on a hob. Life, life, what are thou? Light or darkness, the base apron of the underfootman or the shadow of the starling on the grass. So this is the first of these paragraphs. And, and what we see uh, Wolf doing here is a, is a catalogue of an ordinary day, which she very, she's very fond of these kinds of catalogue, alternative catalogues of everyday life. Um, in fact, we'll find uh, an almost replica of this particular catalogue, this particular chronotopic setting um, in between the acts. Um, again with, with the birds and, uh, and the servants passing by in the courtyard and so on. So, um, so she's really fond of this. But what we also see here is the suspension of the archive, as if the archivist who constellates all these material traces insists not only on these traces being somehow something that fiction usually neglects, but also that the relationships established between these facts are subject to the working of the unknown. This is evident in the emphasis on not having capacity to conclusively know or understand actions and their results, and exteriorized in the proliferation of the word or. So clouds are either thick or thin. One begins tossing up either one question or two. Life sings or croons. It is light or darkness. It is the base apron of the servant or the shadow of a starling. But of course, I am re-archiving this paragraph myself as I'm speaking to you. And I have to admit that I have chosen it not because it is unique in the text, uh, there are many other paragraphs of archival sorts like this one, but because it contains the word cryptic. The word itself is inserted in the key sentence in the paragraph, one that indicates the incomprehensibility of time, the deceptiveness of our endeavor to record it or contain it, 
and one of the many sentences that mark the time passing and, uh, and the, the changes that happen in, in that process with the same material fact, material facts such as a text of Virginia Woolf's Orlando. So the day after she wrote the last word of Orlando, Virginia Woolf noted in her diary that it was all a joke. In fact, Orlando is one of the most ambitious and complex texts that Woolf ever wrote. Uh, in it, Woolf experiments with a new form for the novel, she reimagines the genre of biography, and she offers a parodic history of England and English literature. As you all know, Orlando's inspiration was Vita Sackville West, the lover whose attention began to wander at exactly the moment that Virginia Woolf conceived the book. With Orlando, Virginia hoped to daz dazzle and punish Vita with her eloquence, her erudition, her erotic mastery, and her capacity for cruelty. But she also hoped to get closer to her. On publication day, October 11, 1928, Virginia presented a leather-bound copy of the novel to Vita. And a couple of months later, she gave her a bound copy of the manuscript. It remains in Knoll House, the massive Sackville estate near Seven Oaks in Kent, where young Vita, the daughter of Lord Sackville, grew up. So Vita Sackville West and Virginia Woolf first met in December 1922 at a dinner party given by Clive Bell, who was Woolf's brother-in-law. Both had been married for several years, Vita to diplomat Harold Nicholson, and Virginia to Leonard Woolf, who was a writer, an editor, and a publisher. Virginia was simultaneously attracted, intrigued, and dismissive of Vita, writing in her diary that she makes me feel virgin, shy, schoolgirlish. Yet after dinner, I wrapped out opinions. She's a grenadier, hard, handsome, manly, inclined to double chin. Uh, and one of the things I like in that diary entry is um, I wrapped out opinions, followed by Vita is a grenadier. So there's a sense of a kind of... Um, uh, adversarial relationship at the very beginning, um, some aggression that's uh, hidden inside the affection or inside the love. And in fact, one of the changes that um, Virginia Woolf made to the, after the, one of the revisions she made to the first manuscript of Orlando was to cut out many of the references to Virginia, to Vita's interest in pain and um, to the sadistic side of her personality, which is toned down significantly in Orlando. Vita obviously wanted to make a good impression on Virginia Woolf, and she immediately started sending Virginia copies of her books, uh, which actually wasn't uh, a terribly good strategy since Virginia thought they weren't very good. Um, <laughs> but of course, Vita didn't know that, so it seemed to her to be a winning streak. Uh, for the next couple of years, the two couples continued to meet regularly, if infrequently, sometimes at dinner parties and sometimes more informally, when Vita and her husband, for example, dropped in unannounced for tea one day. But it wasn't until February 1924, so about 18 months later, that the two women spent significant time alone together, crouching on the floor, eating a picnic lunch amongst the dirt and dust of Virginia's packing cases she was moving house. In July of that year, the two women visited Noel together, as we've heard, and Virginia was struck by the ways in which Noel, inhabited by Vita's silent father, his mistress, and a squad of retainers, seemed like a house abandoned by time. Ropes fenced off half the rooms. The chairs and the pictures looked preserved. Life has left them. Not for a hundred years have the retainers sat down to dinner in the great hall. And I'm sure this is incredibly obvious to all of you, but um, the word life occurs in the text over and over and over again. And, and Sally read um, this morning some, some of the places where that happens. And um, not to belabor the point, but. Uh, Vita means life, and it seems to me that in many of the, well, certainly in this quotation, one of the things she's thinking about is the abandonment of the house by the family and the gradual contraction of the family itself um, into a small number of rooms, while most of the rooms remain unoccupied. Um, so that's the quotation from the diary. In Orlando, but everywhere were little lavender bags to keep the moth out, and printed notices, please do not touch which, though she had put them there herself, seemed to rebuke her. The house was no longer hers entirely, she sighed. It belonged to time now, to history. It was past the touch and control of the living. Gradually, the women's mutual fascination grew with one another. They started to spend weekends together. And when Vita went on a walking tour of the Dolomites with her husband Harold in August of 1924, Vita and Virginia wrote long, intimate letters exploring one another's capacity for closeness, and for the first but not the last time, 
they started to say things that hurt each other. Their exchanges grew increasingly intimate and flirtatious and their visits more frequent. Virginia's publishing house, the Hogarth Press, published its novels, Seduces in Ecuador, in 1924. But it wasn't until December 1925 that their romance really took off and unleashed Virginia's creative and lyric imagination in ways that led directly to Orlando. Vita was preparing to leave for several months in Tehran with Harold, who had a diplomatic post there. Virginia was feeling slighted. In November, Vita had not visited her, and an invitation to spend a weekend at Long Bar, Vita and Harold's home in Kent, was slow in coming. But when it did come, Virginia was apprehensive, and it was her husband Leonard who requested her to accept, or at least so she said in the diary that he seems on occasion to have read. For her part, Vita, who enjoyed an open marriage with Harold, who was gay, reassured him that no one was going to fall in love with anyone. Virginia was an exquisite companion, she said, but that was all. And actually, for the first year or so that after Virginia and Vita became lovers, um, Vita's letters have repeated reassurances to Harold that nothing is going to happen, it's not going to go wrong, Virginia is not going to um, be thrown off balance mentally by their intimacy, and that she herself, Vita, is not going to disturb the careful structure of the marriage that she and Harold have set up. The two nights that Vita and Virginia spent alone at Long Barn before Leonard arrived to join them on Saturday were a revelation to Virginia. But out of caution in her diary, she expressed all the delight of her newfound erotic pleasure in exquisitely lyrical descriptions of Vita, rather than in detailed accounts of what actually went on between them. Not that she would have ever written that, but it's a very circumspect diary entry. Um, and I, when I was reading the passage from Noel about Please Do Not Touch, it seemed to me that that also is a sort of... Um, resonates with the notion that the book itself is, as I think Sonia said, a kind of touch or a kind of caress um, that is engaging all the same with prohibitions of all different kinds. Many of the lyrical descriptions in the diary underlie the extraordinary eroticism of Orlando itself. For example, this is a Vita in Seven Oaks, uh, and this is a description that comes up over and over again in Walt's letters and diaries to Vita about Vita in either a fishmonger or a draper or a grocer's shop in Seven Oaks. I like being with her and the splendor. She shines in the grocer's shop in Seven Oaks with a candlelit radiance, stalking on legs like beech trees, pink glowing, grape clustered, pearl hum. And the grapes and the pearls come up over and over again in Orlando also, as, as many of you all know. Several times in Orlando, Orlando is described as incandescent, glowing, lit from within. He was like a million candled Christmas tree, such as they had in Russia, hung with yellow globes, incandescent, enough to light a whole street by, so one might translate it. For what with his glowing cheeks, his dark curls, his black and crimson cloak, he looked as if he were burning with his own radiance from a lamp lit within. 